Hello and welcome to IABM TV. I'm Lorenzo Zanni, Head of Insight and Analysis at the IABM. Today we're going to look at trends in the monetized segment uh, of uh, our industry. And we are joined by Alan Klosowski, VP of Advanced Solutions Group uh, at Spotex, Diane Stratner, CEO of DataZoom, and Kristen Bullet, Commanding Director of Pixel. Thank you very much for being here today. Let me start from, from you, Alan. Uh, from a very general perspective, what do you see as the main drivers of change uh, in uh, monetize? So, in, in general, in monetizing audiences, what we see as kind of a primary driving factor is the idea that you can start valuing each individual um, member of the audience uh, uniquely. So, instead of looking at groups or indexes in the way that a specific show or uh, content may index. Uh, in general, what we can start looking at is the ability to zero in on individual households or devices or viewers and be able to look at how would, as a, a brand or agency, how would you think about you know, that value of that individual to get your message uh, delivered to and then price accordingly, which ultimately changes it from looking at something that's uh, much you know, more mass reach buying into very uh, personalized and individual buying by audience. Thanks for that. Diane? Yeah, I think feeding off of what you just said, um, if we're going to have a hyper-targeted and very customary way of uh, monetizing audiences, I think it introduces new challenges in terms of resiliency for making sure that all the systems are working uh, together and that we can actually uh, make sure that maybe a new wider variety of ads are getting uh, playing back a high quality experience for those viewers so from my perspective interested in operationally how we can make that really successful. Yeah. Uh, so I look at it from a slightly different perspective. Yeah. I look at it from an architectural perspective, and I see a continued convergence of linear and on-demand. But also that leans towards a natural convergence of technologies, which means time to replace technologies. So that means that people are willing to start investing in those platforms and doing interesting things with them. Um, it's possibly fortuitous as much as anything else. Yeah. And of course, data is increasingly an important asset uh, in making all of this work. Uh, what's your view on it and the challenges uh, of media companies uh, uh, in dealing with data? So, Pixel focus only on metadata, um, and that is all we care about. So it's clearly very important to us. Yeah. Um, one of the problems I see is the industry continues to look at approaching all of the problems in the same way that they always have done from a traditional linear broadcast yeah. perspective. But we've now got two-way communications, we can understand what the end user is doing, um, and then we've got the, the new arrivals with the Facebooks trying to approach it from a different angle, but they're, they're still doing the same thing of using the same legacy perspective to how they approach things. Yeah. You can gather as much data as you want, but you need to apply it correctly. Yeah, yeah. And Diane? Yeah, I think from the perspective of DataZoom, like we are also we're a video data infrastructure platform. So we capture, uh, centralize, classify, and connect data in real time. And so from our worldview, um, you know, part of the data we gather falls into that category of monetization yeah. data. We can pick up events from the perspective of the end user actually embedded at that web page or application level about you know um, vast events, even the vast tag, things like that. And so for us, that falls into kind of a greater category of use cases that extend beyond the ones I think we've been applying today, which has been mainly around analytics. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, if you had really great data, and I think the definition of great data, maybe we can define it. So I think great data is um, standardized. So independent of which system we're using, yeah. player we're using, we have a consistent way of understanding that data. I think data is also, um, in this case, in real time as well. Yeah. Right, so if we understand, if we get a data point in with 10 milliseconds of latency, it's actually a lot more valuable than a data point that's maybe even one second worth of latency. And that's because if we want to use data to go beyond the function of analytics and more towards automation, yeah. um, then real-time data is a real key part of this. So from our, my perspective as well, um, you know, I think automation is a huge area of opportunity 
specifically in the advertising space, and there's yeah. some really low hanging fruit today. Yeah, and that's where AI comes into play as well. Yeah, I think AI, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a broadly used <laughs> applied term. Um, I think from our perspective, specifically machine learning and maybe applying some unsupervised learning over data yeah. sets to develop algorithms is where this industry will first begin to apply AI. Um, and for us, you know, that comes into how we might form rules around an automation engine to, for example, retry a failed ad, however we define a failure. It's yeah. an error code, if it's a low response time, things like that. Yeah, thanks for that. And what's your view on that? So, <coughs> you know, if I'm thinking about data, and bringing data into a transaction, what we're really seeing a big trend for right now is the idea that the advertisers, brands, and agencies want to be able to bring and activate their own data inside of these environments. And so building frameworks that, you know, while metadata is, is very important, context data is also very important, data about the audience is, um, yeah. I would say, really valuable. And it's gone from the idea that there are third-party data sets out there that people can do to understand whether somebody is an auto intender or a household with children or a high income household to now the brands and particularly the very, very large brands, um, auto manufacturers, for example, who are looking at this saying, okay, I have my own CRM data. I have my own, um, you know, my own ability to really understand my customers. So how do I take that, marry that with a video delivery system so that the advertising is getting personalized uh, to the end user as they're viewing the, con the content, whether that's you know uh, doing things like copy splitting and creative versioning, whether that's actually different ads to different people depending on which products and services <laughs> fit. And so I think a key to the future is really building these frameworks that are also standardized in a way that we can bring in all of this additional data and activate it and do it at scale. Yeah, right. interesting. Yeah, Kristen? Also about uh, on AI and ML. What's your view? I, I, I like your comment on well, the hoof in relation to the term AI because the I, seemingly yeah. everything is called AI or yeah. ML. And if it's just computer programming, it, it doesn't actually mean anything at that point. Um, my experiences of watching companies trying to move to AI and ML has been very faddy. Let's do something that looks interesting and sexy from a POC perspective. Yeah. But that doesn't come back to increasing revenue and reducing cost yeah uh, and that's that's where you need to be before you start to try and do something exploratory and interesting yeah I think I think you know every, every PSC is not going to it's not a moonshot right yeah yeah I wanted to um, append something to your comment about <laughs> trying to integrate more of the data we already have as a essentially DMP data right. into the ad flow um, I would say that like, I think there's an interesting concept that's yet to be applied out there, which is that, if you think about it, there's actually tons of DMPs out there. Mm -hmm. And so why limit yourself to one? Why only have your own data that you're using to target? So as an example, you know, there's many other industries that are outside of our natural, our, the media space, right? Um, many, like, think about like an application like, uh, like Lyft or Uber, they actually have a ton of information that would be valuable for helping to improve targeting. But um, we are not, uh, at least the media industry is not looking to those types of data sources to pull that in. Yeah. I mean, I think something that could be interesting moving forward along the targeting perspective is how do we amplify our DMP or have DMP as a service right. in some perspective, right? And I think if you're able to be from technology perspective, if we can maybe modify the way, modify some of the flow of information um, to enable insertion before we make that request out to therefore get higher valued campaigns, then that could be something. Yeah, I mean, I, no, I totally agree, and I, I think it's some well, some of the things that we've actually focused quite a bit on because we have we realized very early on that there was there's not really one DMP to, to rule them all, so. Um, we integrate with about 10 or 12 different DMPs right now, and one of the, the key things that we're working on is the idea that you can take a segment, uh, let's say that the actual media owner or broadcaster has their own uh, segments, first party data, and you have third party data, the two are using two different DMPs, how do you create kind of a universal connection layer between those two that you can kind of commingle those segments so that you can 
add value from the data that the broadcaster brings or the MDPD brings, at the same time bringing in that third-party data so now I know auto intenders that also watch Top Gear and I can pull those two things together into one uh, one stack. So uh, we spent a lot of time on that. It's not as easy as it as it uh, you know as you would think it might be because everybody uses a different key or a different syncing and it, it requires a lot of um, a lot of work on the back end to kind of connect that up. But we're starting to make good progress on that front, and it, I think it's valuable. Do you not find there's a reluctance for people to enable transcending uh, different segments? People are reluctant to share that information. Well, I think it depends on where. So if we've got different segments, so. Let's say you're you're syncing with any one of the DMPs. You're, you're creating kind of a customized or a unified identifier for that user that, that floats across multiple DMPs. Then the idea is just being able to bring those two things in together simultaneously. <laughs> so at that point, it's really it's really about commingling those segments so that you can you can get more than one data point. You can decorate, right? Maybe a request, I guess. But it requires that data to be shared between the different segments and the different owners in that respect as well. Not necessarily because if there's a bridge between the two, you, you essentially, if you have the rights to use this segment and this segment and the two are keyed off of different things, if you've created a unified key between the two, then you can just simply enable both. And, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that one data provider is sharing their data with another data provider. It just means that when, that, when you see that user, you can identify that they're in both segments and with uh, kind of an end state that you can bring them together. Well, I think from the, from the perspective of uh, data privacy, it's not that you have to share direct one-to-one -one information about someone. The idea is you want enhanced targeting, right? So similar to the action of I'm going to go to, you know, what would be an, ex an example? Like you go to, um, you can take a device ID and you can take it to Facebook and Facebook returns back values. This is a person of this, you know, gender and of this age range and this income and these interests and things like that. Like even that type of information, I think, sure. probably no more than me, but I would assume would be helpful and well, the, the using device identifier or advertising identifiers off of devices is a, is a great example of the way that you can actually bring in multiple segments and that device identifier becomes, or the advertising identifier, it's not really a device identifier, but the advertising identifier from, from the device is something that is a, a key that transcends multiple data sets. So then you can use them in any combination that you want. Um, and then there's other ways to do that based on you know, synthetic subscriber IDs and all sorts of things. Yeah, and Chris, you, you, ma uh, you mentioned convergence bef uh, before, and mm -hmm. the of course, the growth of OTT uh, as well. And most of the OTT models have been focused uh, until now on subscriptions. Mm -hmm. What is preventing Avo uh, Avo to, to take off from your perspective? I think people don't want adverts. Yeah. I think. I think that's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, but then I come back to my point about following legacy approaches. I think if we can transform the way programmatic and on-demand advertising is presented, yeah. then if that can be done in a way in which it appeals to consumers, that's great. If you're trying to focus <coughs> and target advertising, well, if I don't want the adverts anyway, it doesn't matter how much you target them. Yeah. So, uh, please, Diane. Okay, I think that there's another like business model that's totally missing from the system today, which mm. is essentially like we have AVOD and then we have subscription, and we don't really have a good example of TBOD, right? Transaction based viewing. And I think we do. Like, you can go rent something for $3.99 on Amazon or whatever. But that's not really economical, right? Like, I'm going to watch a video for, for, you know, 48 hour window or whatever it is. Um, I think there's another one, which is if you think about it, if you're willing to stand up um, at an AVOD service and you want to give someone the option of either watching an ad or paying to not see the ad. Why not say, okay, like I'm gonna, I will have made if all the ads are delivered, 38 cents off this view. Why not say, give me 50 cents, right? I think there's like an entirely new business model that's missing in our space today. I'd be curious to see, and I think that the challenge on that would be the payment side, right? Like, how do you deal with these micropayments? Micropayments are not new. We do micropayments every time we use many uh, commonly used games, right? So I think this is where some of the like MVPDs or even some of the platforms yeah. have a leg up where like I think they're missing a huge game here to go put out a lot of content um, and have people decide to either pay for a subscription or if they don't want to subscribe to a specific segment of content, suffer through some ads. Yeah. I'm going to throw another hype word on the blockchain. What do you think about that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> God. Uh, so but it's an enabler for the microtransactions. Yeah. 
Yeah. And well, that makes sense. If it can process quickly enough. I mean, I think, you're on, the, I think you're on to something with the hybrid, hybrid model, or not to, to, to jump on the uh, off of the blockchain thing, but the um, just to kind of some examples to, to reinforce your point. What we're seeing is if you look at um, like rental services like Voodoo, for example, which is uh, one of our customers, and it's a Walmart company, they have the ability that you can either uh, choose to watch the movie with ads or you can choose to pay the rental fee. And so that gives you the choice to, to determine how you want to do that. And I think what they've said uh, is that choose your adventure. Yes, yeah, kind of choose your adventure. But like during the week, what they find is people put it on with ads. And then on the weekend, people who want to sit down and like really focus, they'll pay for it. And so, you know, Monday through Thursday, uh, lots of ads are consumed. Friday, Saturday, a lot less, and it's more transactional that way. Um, and, and we see a lot of these kind of hybrid models. We're seeing it inside cable environments. It'll do the same thing, like unlock. Um, like VOD content, if you're willing to watch ads, you know, there's, there's different models to, to give people what they want. Not every country, though, has the same economics. So we've seen like SVOD and TVOD try to happen in, in certain places like in Asia, yeah. and the piracy's not yeah. that out, so then they move to an AVOD service and then it, then it tends to work. <clears throat> Other environments where there's maybe more disposable income, you know, being able to do SVOD services or multiple SVOD services is much more reality. And I think also it would have to probably even go deeper than that, which is an opportunity and a challenge, which is that I know that like if I'm just watching some series or something like that, I'm okay probably with watching an ad, but if like Game of Thrones premiere is going to come out but it was ad supported, I'm going to skip that ad. Because well, I don't want to ruin my, I'm in an emotional state right, when I'm enough. watching this content. You know? Well, and, and to your point earlier about the, the idea that um, you know, if programmatic could get better. I mean, what you're seeing with even companies like Hulu, for example, they're announcing that they're pulling back their ad load. Nice. So, yeah, the idea if, is if we can make more personalized, more relevant, better ads, could we show less of them? So instead of having 16 minutes of ads an hour, could we get down to four or five minutes of ads an hour? Is that much more tolerable and, and palatable? And, and, you know, I think to, to now it's gotten to the point where it's almost overwhelmed. But, I mean, yeah. Sorry, you go ahead. Uh, but if, you know, I, I look at what I want, and I want to be able to choose what content I want to watch using whatever business model I want and whatever service I want. And I'm really fussy, and I change my mind all of the time. So that's going to change frequently. And I like to choose your adventure statement, because if I want to watch my adverts while I'm on my tube ride to work in the morning and save them for later on, maybe I've earned my ad time for the evening by doing that. Right? Yeah. There's lots of, there's lots of nice things that we could try. Yeah. Lots of opportunities. Do you want to come back on the blockchain? Oh, want to sorry, know. I know we yeah. jumped right over, right, right <laughs> over blockchain. I, I apologize. The, um, you know, so where I see blockchain having a big impact is uh, there's there's a couple. There's obviously there's the the idea that you could control your own kind of data marketplace and what the data is yeah. worth to you, and there's kind of this uh, this concept that there's this data economy on the individual, and you have some control over that. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I'm 100% into that, but where I do think it makes a lot of sense is, um, particularly where we see it, we see uh, live events where there's really, really high concurrency. So, so you have millions of people tuned in watching a program simultaneously. And what we find is that uh, because of this stress that, that a live event actually puts on the entire ecosystem of all the downstream ad servers, all the technology partners, that uh, discrepancies between partners happen because things like basic beacons and other pieces get dropped. Uh, where I see blockchain, if you can, particularly if you can scale it up, having a big impact is the ability to record things like impression or data usage and other things into yeah. the chain so that each partner, particularly in live events or high scale concurrency events, can read it back out at their own pace without overwhelming their, their system. So, so you essentially have somebody up front who can process a large amount of data records all the transactions and all the downstream partners can read out of that and then uh, it's in a way that they have complete transparency yeah. of what happened. Interesting. In yeah. some way that's kind of what we do at DataZoom in some regard, not cool. for all the things, but essentially, you know, we, our methodology is a single, you know, one of the challenges we see all the time is um, uh, we're expecting, you know, the, the, the publisher is expecting to make X amount of money and then they see another amount of money that they made from that content. Mm -hmm. And they're like, my data that I got from my player is like totally different than the data right. that I'm seeing inside my app server. And so, you know, I think it comes, you know, somehow a little bit back around to blockchain, but it uh, comes down to some other problems where 
Uh, right now, there's a lot of dis there's actually not a lot of communication in terms of data between uh, where we're watching um, content that it, where ads are played and where we're serving ads from. And so you get things like there's an article published um, by the uh, working group inside of an industry organization called the Streaming Video Alliance around advertising. And the publisher in this case was talking about how they are uh, pumping up their fill rate to like 110% because they're assuming that things are just going to fail. Mm. That has a ton of downstream effect and problem, right? But part of it is because is it actually that we didn't serve the ad? Did the core tunneling event just not make it into the ad? So there's kind of no way of knowing that unless we are starting with a single source of data. So uh, in, in a different realm where we are solving these challenges is people trying to measure something as simple as like, well, what's my buffer ratio, mm -hmm. right? If you have three different mechanisms capturing this data, um, unless the data itself is exactly the same, which it might not always be, and the calculations are exactly the same, which might not always be, and we have a layer of transparency that transcends both of those things, then we can't actually do any root cause analysis. So you get these two tools that measure two things very differently, and someone's stuck with being unable to di dive deeper yeah. and diagnose. Um, I wanted to loop back around to, well, first of all, what I think is missing from this ecosystem is a feedback loop of data from, a, from the point of the publisher back to the ad server, like errors, right? Things like that, or, you know, um, so you served an ad and we got the ad asset, but then the ad asset didn't make it to the player and reporting on that. Well, I mean, part of that's VAST 3 and VAST 4 has got the error codes and start to give that reporting back to the ad server. But I mean, to your point, I mean, it, it just gets harder. The more data that you have to reconcile, the more uh, uh, chance that you have that you're going to get, you know, discrepant uh, kind of events that are, that, are, that are happening. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, when you're out of sync and you could have one you know, advertiser ad server trying to serve just a handful of ads that serves millions because it, because the feedback loop is broken. You just need to try and serve one ad and not recording it to try and serve that one ad a million times. And then the publisher thinks they got a million, million ads. Or, or right? even like the ad server doesn't return an error, but the ad is like really slow to return. And so the user's experience and quality of experience event, it's experiencing buffering. And there's no way for the publisher to say, hey, your ad took like a million years to get here, buddy. And so the user left. And by the way, this is probably affecting your like eCPM for how this campaign is performing because you know it keeps saying that it's trying to serve it and you know but we're not getting core tiling events and therefore not to mention that you're not optimizing against that data so that just keeps happening over and over again. Exactly. And they're not serving their ad and you're not getting paid because you didn't serve an ad you already made. It sucks. Decision. And where's the solution to this? I think the solution <laughs> is by providing a standard interface for people to share back data with not only the ad servers but even the advertisers behind that. And I think that there's some kind of open source projects that could be, you know, ways of presenting data um, in this regard. Something that we've been, it's been on my mind at least. That's nice. And, and, it, and there's something else I want to bring up in terms of blockchain where I think blockchain would be applied would actually be in a totally different realm, but actually in the area of content licensing. Yeah. So if you think about it, at the end of the day, like let's take Netflix. They're going to have a ton of residual content. They have a sunk cost for that content. At the end of the day, someone's probably not subscribing to Netflix anymore to get that content. The best thing they can do is actually uh, have this content be made available to other systems. Yeah. So I think that in the future also, there might be some rejiggering of who, what services we buy from whom and who puts content where. Like Maybe you end up having the content creator that owns the CDN, like the files on the, and then owns the CDN deployments and they all just get passed, here's a URL to go stream this stuff, and we use blockchain to record how many requests came from which publishers, and then you know have a way of recording all those transactions. But we are in early days for that, yeah. yeah. I think we're in early days for blockchain yeah. in general, yeah. so I think our industry will just sit back Just scratching the surface. Uh, well, yeah, well, the biggest issue is you gotta solve the scale on, on the processing time. It takes too long yeah. to process and record the transactions. So on, on, you know, when we're looking at an event that may have 10 million people tuned in simultaneously, you can't record all that information quickly enough in, in a distributed ledger blockchain yeah. type system. system. I mean, there are some proprietary blockchain systems out there that are really cool. I mean, Akamai has some really, really neat the stuff that they're doing for financial processing that could be applied. There, there's interesting things that are happening, but um, I think it, it's still a matter of speed and scale. Yeah. Uh, in order to get there, and then the industry coming together to agree that they're even going to use these um, thing. And I don't think 
beyond the scale issue, I don't think you have enough coordination with all the parties in you know the ad servers and the other and the DSPs and the SSPs and the publisher ad servers and the you know brand ad servers. Like they're not there yet to where they're like, oh, okay, we'll just read all the information yeah. out of a ledger. So yeah. I think you're looking at it as a technology problem, and it is a technology problem. Don't get me wrong, but I have a high level of cynicism across the industry. You've got a lot of people involved in that chain of getting the ad from from the root to the person, and everyone's taking a couple of cents here and there off that. If you're gonna streamline that and simplify it, there's going to be a big fight. People want, people want their dollar. Well, certainly, but I think you don't necessarily, I think the, the difference in terms of the value that each one of those steps in the platform take is, is they all provide a different value to a different person in, in the chain, right? So the DSPs who are taking their cut are providing data activation and targeting and the ability to manage a campaign over multiple video sources and make sense of all this information and really hone in on, on your, your your um, audiences, and that's kind of why they're getting their cut. You've got the SSPs who are working with all the publishers saying, okay, well, you've got, all, you've got 70 DSPs out there, you've got thousands of brands, you've got all of these things that are happening. How do you make that, like, how do you, how do you optimize, organize, and, and, and essentially get the best yield you possibly can out? And that's kind of why they're, they're there. And I don't think just because the fees are transparent that those, those two components are any less valuable. So you, you, know, you have primary ad server, what that does, you've got SSPs, you've got DSP, you've got a DMP, all of them have very clear value propositions. And so, yes, I think more transparency into the pricing structure helps, but I think all of those are, are value-added services. If they weren't, people would just go back to passing tags around, but it's very difficult to execute a campaign and optimize against an audience over you know, 20 or 30 different uh, outlets where you're running your ad and you're trying to optimize that in real time if you're going back to the manual. Yeah, thank you very much for that. A lot of interest. Yeah, I would love to stay here all day hearing about blockchain and AI, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of time anymore. Thank you very much for all the interesting insights. Um, and but I wanted to ask you a very brief a last question to all of you, coming back to the general, starting from you, Anna, Alan. Uh, what's coming next for Monetize from your perspective, and what's your com company uh, planning for for the long term? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'll go back to it. Like, I, I think the basics um, are, there's a lot of things that you can do to, to really, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, the, you've got the sizzle and then you've got the steak, right? I, I think, you know, focusing on the core problems and the core problems for us uh, that we hear over and over again from large CPG brands or auto manufacturers or others is how do I, now, if I'm looking at the fact that audiences have moved away from traditional TV, uh, yeah. not all of them, but, but particularly the younger audiences have moved over in, in, in big numbers. Uh, so now there's scale there, and if I, if I continue to advertise inside of traditional TV, I'm missing uh, a large segment, like it's not even getting my ads. Yeah. So then um, I think what they, they then look at is go, well, okay, now if I'm, if I'm, in, if I'm interacting with this new, new medium being OTT or you know, addressable advertising or anywhere that I can kind of get a one-to-one -one message to the consumer, it's like, how do I find my consumers and how do I activate my data and then how do I close the loop on attribution yeah. on that? So how do I know that if I did advertise to this individual or group of individuals that the results or outcomes change and how do I measure that? And I think the biggest piece for us is creating the framework to enable that for advertisers yeah. and then enable the, the broadcasters to do that because that's, that's where the that's where the money's money's coming from. They're, they're looking at OTT fundamentally different as it's, it's not quite digital. I call it like digital minus, but it is TV plus. It's it's better than TV when it comes to measurement and attribution. Thanks for that, Diane. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you hit the nail on the head with targeting. So targeting the day benefits both sides um, to be able to understand the performance of their campaigns and trace it back to uh, you know noticeable uptick from certain demographics, things like that. Um, and I think it obviously benefits the publishers from uh, getting uh, higher CPMs. I think from our perspective, what we're doing in DataZoom, we're really trying to say, okay, if we have a, a world that's getting like ever more complex and we have less directly sold campaigns, we're moving more towards real-time bidding and things like that, then again, there's a ton of operational challenges there. And we want to ensure resiliency for those services. So yeah. that example of, you know, we detected that there was a, an error code. We want to trigger something that says, make sure we, there's a failure. There's only one thing we can do, restart, right? Being a mechanism to do some of that restarting. So trying to approach this from a little more of an operational perspective. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. Kristen? Um, from a targeted advertising, I'd like to see more of an introduction of context awareness. Yeah. Um, and 
and mood awareness and time awareness as well. I think there's a lot to be explored there that hasn't been explored yet. Um, I'd like to stop receiving adverts for something I looked at and bought on Amazon 15 minutes ago, <laughs> which is a common problem for me. <laughs> um, and then as part of what Pixel are doing, we're not an app provider, but we provide a, a, sim a central plane of visibility of content and what is happening with that content. Yeah. And I think that's very important because I, I work with tier one organizations and there are so many silos of information within those organizations. People need to figure out what's going on already today before they try and build and make advances on top of that. Yeah. It's a whole mess to clean up. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the interesting discussion. Thank you. If you want to have more information, please visit the IBM website. Thank you and thank you. <laughs>